Since the preparation and recording of today's service, we have, of course, learned of the death of His Royal Highness, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Since his death on Friday, very many tributes have been paid to him by individuals who knew him and through the various media sources. In common with many ministerial colleagues through the years, I have had the privilege of meeting the Duke of Edinburgh when I was invited to stay at Balmoral and preach at Crathy Kirk. From that little glimpse into the royal family, including that encounter with Prince Philip, I certainly would echo so much of what has been said over this last couple of days regarding his inquisitive mind, his incisive wit, his love of a good discussion, his loving dedication to Her Majesty the Queen, and, I can add to that, his excellent skills at the barbecue. We rightly give thanks for his dedication to service and for his several initiatives for the public good, and we pray God's blessing on Her Majesty the Queen at this time of deep loss for her, remembering too the whole family as they bear this loss. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, the life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But you are forever, from everlasting to everlasting, and we put our trust in you, for you have promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Loving Lord, in this last year, through the worst of a global pandemic, we have been face to face with our fragility and vulnerability, perhaps for some of us as never before. Against that backdrop of hurt and loss, we give you thanks for the life and service of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Some are called to the front of the stage, others to supporting roles, and we rejoice in the way he supported Her Majesty the Queen through all the years of her reign. We remember, too, his work supporting charities, and perhaps most memorably for young people for over 60 years, his patronage of the Duke of Edinburgh Awards Scheme. In this hour of loss, we offer our heartfelt prayers for Her Majesty and her family. Comfort them in their loss, bind up their wounds, and grant them the consolation of a store of treasured memories. Grant to Her Majesty the peace that comes from knowing you and which passes all understanding. These are prayers we ask in the name of Jesus, who through his life, death and resurrection offers us hope instead of despair, life instead of death. Amen. Good morning and welcome to this morning's online service from Queen's Park Govan Hill Parish Church. This is the second Sunday of Easter and we'll be continuing to consider the risen appearances of our Lord. And today in particular, his appearance to the disciples in the upper room and then to Thomas a week later, another of his disciples who was not there the first time. As you know, we are preparing to return to worship in the building here on Sunday the 2nd of May. As you will also recall, I'm sure, you were required to book your place by contacting our session clerk, Joe Gibb. Places will be limited, so do book quickly. And remember also to book also for Sundays after the 2nd of May if you're intending to come. It is not clear how long we will need to have restrictions on activity in our services or for how long we may need to have to book. But meanwhile, we will all need to book our places, to refrain from singing, to wear face coverings, to keep physically distant from one another, and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, our online services will continue for the rest of April. And then once we do return to the church building in May, we'll be live casting these services so that those of you who have to or who choose to stay at home, meanwhile, can still join with us in our weekly worship. And now, let us share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace be with you.
The Lord is gracious and compassionate, long-suffering and faithful. The Lord is good to all. His compassion rests on all his creatures. Let us pray. God of life and hope, we come this day in worship to give you the glory and to sing your praises. In this Easter season, we rejoice that you have conquered sin and death, darkness and despair, and have brought us freedom, life, light and hope. All praise and glory to you. God of terror and joy, you arise to shake the earth. Open our graves and give us back the past, so that all that has been buried may be freed and forgiven, and our lives may return to you. In these strange days of social isolation, restricted activity and anxious uncertainty, May we be assured that just as your risen Son appeared to the fearful disciples behind locked doors, so he is with us in our ongoing lockdown and as we continue our gradual emergence from it. And hear us now as we confess to you our sins in penitence and in faith. We confess to you our selfishness and our lack of love. We confess to you our fear and reluctance to share our faith. We confess to you our stubbornness and our lack of trust. Hear our confession of these and all our sins and have mercy upon us, we pray. Sisters and brothers, Jesus died and rose again for you. Know that in him your sins are forgiven and be at peace. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose words we further pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Good morning Pathfinders and welcome to church this morning. Have a look at what's in front of you. A tin of Heinz cream of tomato soup. If I was to tell you that I had hidden £20 inside that tin, I doubt that you would believe me because you can't see it. If you look at the tin, down the side it tells you what all the ingredients are. It tells you how to cook the soup, how to heat it up. It tells you the nutrition information on the back. It's a perfectly normal tin of soup and yet I've maybe or maybe not hidden £20 inside the tin. I think only seeing would help you believe that I had done it, wouldn't it? So maybe we could see if there's £20 inside the tin. There is £20 inside this tin of Heinz tomato soup. In fact, there's no soup. But seeing helps you believe things, doesn't it? We're going to hear about somebody who didn't believe something this morning because they couldn't see it for themselves. And it wasn't until Thomas saw for himself that he was able to believe what had happened to Jesus. Three days after his death on the cross, Jesus appeared to the disciples. But you know, believing things that we haven't seen is especially hard when they're totally unexpected. And it was like that for Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples. He wasn't with the other disciples when Jesus first appeared to them. 
The other disciples told Thomas all about seeing Jesus, but Thomas didn't believe them. It was such an odd and unexpected thing to be told that Thomas said that unless he saw Jesus for himself and was able to touch him, he wouldn't believe it. It can be hard for us to trust and have faith when we don't get to see Jesus like the disciples did. But there's good news for those of us that believe without first seeing. So a week after the first appearance, Jesus came again to the disciples. This time Thomas was there to witness it and he had quite a meeting coming up. We are lucky because we have the events written down for us in the Bible. But Thomas didn't have that. We can look at the evidence and weigh it up. The Bible was written with the important purpose of describing to us the events that took place in the life of Jesus. But John, who wrote this part of the the Bible, was an eyewitness to the life of Jesus. He definitely saw what was going on. And he gave his accounts so that we can trust and believe that these things are really true. Our reading is taken from John, chapter 20, reading from verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. For this reading from his holy word, thanks be to God. He's been called Doubting Thomas. It's just not fair. It's not fair. Now, I wish I had a pound for every time I heard one or other of our children utter these words over the years when they were growing up. It's not fair. Of course, while they may have thought that their brother, or more usually sister, was being treated with uncharacteristic leniency or generosity while they were being unjustly burdened with excessive expectations or sanctions, the reality, of course, is that these accusations of injustice were not founded on much hard evidence. It was just the natural complaint of a child. It's not fair. However, if the Apostle Thomas were to insist that it was not fair, then I would have considerably more sympathy for him, and I would be inclined to agree. It does seem rather unfair that he alone was absent when Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room on the evening of that first Easter day. We're not told why he alone was absent, but for whatever reason, he was not there. 
And that does seem a bit unfair to me. But he was there the following week when Jesus again appeared. And having seen for himself the evidence that the others had already had presented to them, he too believes. So why is he alone singled out as being the doubter? Thomas has every reason for feeling that that is not fair. It's not fair that the church has remembered him for his doubts. On the basis of this one story, he has always been known as doubting Thomas. And yet the fact is that Thomas is not shown to be any more of a doubter than most of the rest of the disciples. And the story is not primarily about doubt anyway. It's about the risen Christ and how he responds to our need for faith. It is not fair. No, indeed, Thomas, it is not. They all doubted until they were presented with the evidence. To single Thomas out as the doubting one does seem to be seriously unfair. He was one of the doubting eleven, no worse than the rest of them, and just possibly a little bit braver and more honest. And he is no different from any of us, for we all doubt don't we? I think we do. And we know that the disciples certainly all did doubt, and no wonder. Some years ago, the Church of England newspaper, the Church Times, published an article by a man called Tom Gardner, in the midst of which he had written the words, God is contemporary. But unfortunately, in the final edition, there was a misprint. And so the sentence actually read in his article, God is temporary. Well, I would imagine that the disciples must have felt that way as they huddled together behind locked doors, fearful and doubting on that first Easter Sunday evening. God is temporary. Certainly the hope that they'd once had of the breaking in of God's kingdom had now passed. The expectation they had once had that the wonderful promises made to them by Jesus would be fulfilled was now no more. God is temporary. Well, even if God wasn't temporary, then in their minds their hope their expectations, their dreams certainly seem to have passed. They hadn't lasted all that long, really. And if there was indeed a God, and I imagine that some of them doubted even that, then he was no longer there, or no longer interested, or no longer the kind of God they had imagined and hoped he was. Their dreams were shattered, their hopes were dashed. Jesus, their friend and Lord, was dead. Their own lives were in danger. Understandably, fear and doubt would have dominated their thinking and their feeling. You see, it really isn't a case of doubting Thomas so much as doubting disciples. And we can hardly blame them. It was a difficult, dark, discouraging, desperate time for them. Their doubts were real. Their fears were justified. Their grief was great. And in these things, they are no different from us. We too have fears. We too have known grief and loss. We too have doubts. But the call of the risen Jesus is to belief and away from doubt. Do not doubt, but believe, he urged Thomas and urges us. Jesus' desire would certainly be that we move beyond our doubts. Do not doubt, but believe. But that said, our doubts and our fears and our grief and our loss are not banished by simply pretending that they do not exist. But Jesus comes to us in his risen prayer and he speaks to our fear, to our grief, and to our loss. And he says, 
in the words that he spoke to the disciples on that first Easter Sunday evening, peace be with you. Hear these words of the risen Jesus spoken to your fear, to your grief, to your loss. Peace be with you. And he comes to us also in his risen power and speaks to us in our doubting when he says in the words he spoke to Thomas, do not doubt, but believe. Hear him speak these words to you. Do not doubt, but believe. He is encouraging us to find peace in place of fear and grief, to choose to believe rather than to doubt. He is calling us, even in the midst of fear and grief and doubt, to choose faith, to choose to believe. Indeed, in the midst of our times of fear and grief and doubt and uncertainty and confusion, the presence of the risen Jesus is with us, and his presence can transform the situation as occurred on these two Sunday evenings in Jerusalem. A band of frightened, grief-stricken, and doubting disciples who, in John's gospel, are hiding behind locked doors for fear. That same band of disciples just a few weeks later, as Luke records it, in the book of Acts, are fearlessly standing before the Sanhedrin and the high priest, insisting that they must obey God and not people, and that Jesus has been raised. You see, the presence of the risen Jesus has transformed them. An encounter with the risen Christ is bound to change things. Don't let us be surprised if we have fears and doubts or if we experience grief or loss. But neither let us be content to remain in that place behind locked doors. As the disciples and as Thomas amongst them experienced, Jesus comes to us into our locked down places in our fears and he comes in response to our doubts. And he touches us where we need to be touched so that we might have the faith and the courage to take the next step as he calls us onwards. May that same risen Christ so bless us in this congregation as we begin our gradual emergence from lockdown that we may have the courage and the faith to take the next steps that are right for us in spite of our fears and our doubts. May the risen Christ transform our lives as he transformed the lives of the disciples, transform our church as he did the early church, and lead us as he led his first followers into the mission of transforming the community around us. For we too are the ones on whom he breathes his Holy Spirit as he breathed on them. We too are the ones whom he sends into mission in the world as he sent them. Do not doubt, but believe. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you to give thanks for all the blessings you have given us as we continue to rejoice in the resurrection of our Jesus Christ, our living Saviour, who sees today, we rededicate our lives and ourselves to his service as our offering. With this, we bring our prayers for others, giving thanks for the skills and compassion of all medical staff and carers, and for the scientists who continue to work to care for the sick, and to discover new treatments and vaccines which will allow us to once again gather in Jesus' name in the near future. We would pray for the oppressed throughout the world, whether in Myanmar, in China, or further afield, or closer to home, those in our parish 
forced to work by unscrupulous gang masters. We pray for peace in our troubled world and cooperation amongst world leaders to allow all affected by the pandemic to benefit from vaccines and to live free from fear. May your spirit comfort the lonely, the bereaved, and all those sick in body or mind. May they know your peace. We ask your blessing on our interim minister, David, and we thank you for his leadership in this difficult time. And as restrictions ease in the coming weeks and months, as we give thanks for the opportunities to come together again and ask that your spirit help us discover new ways of worship and service to one another and to all people in our parish and beyond. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. resurrection and may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you evermore. Amen. <laughs>